Okay, so I've been dying to do this for some time and thanks to an unfortunate accident resulting in a bricked Xbox Series S. Well, now I have no excuse. We can tear down Microsoft's beautiful mini console. We can strip it apart to its bare bones, a process you can only really do with a dead machine as once you're down to the main board, it's not really possible to put it back together again. But hey, I had the pleasure of taking apart an Xbox Series X on Microsoft's campus back in the day and so the opportunity to do the same thing with Series S is mouthwatering. And my conclusion? Simply brilliantly designed machine. It really is. If a PC manufacturer put out a mini computer like this, they'd be getting rave reviews. The concept of it being a mainstream console available for $300 or 250 of our great British pounds. It's phenomenal. Yes, the core spec is significantly reduced from Series X and yes, I do still have issues with its memory allocation. But cheap? Well, certainly in terms of quality, no way. Let's open up the Series S and take a look. Now, access is easy via a couple of plastic stickers on the rear of the unit. A scalpel peels those back easily enough, exposing the two screws that are your entry point. That's it, two screws. You'll need a Torx 8 screwdriver to remove them and indeed every other screw in the machine. And then the base plate of the machine uh, just pulls away to reveal the internal cage, part and parcel of the design of Xbox machines since, well, 360 I think. From there we have more Torx 8 screws and plenty of them. Green, silver and black. Now I'm going to start here with the green ones, which seem to attach the top and bottom parts of the internal chassis. These are pretty long as a result, as you can see, but yeah, green screws, I like it. <laughs> There's attention to detail even on the stuff you can't see. Next up, I removed the shorter silver screws. Uh, the black ones, they seem to be part of the thermal assembly, so I left those where they were during this part of the disassembly. Turning the machine over, the top now easily comes free, allowing us to see the internal chassis from the other angle. We're making progress in accessing the innards of the machine. But first of all, external modules, which take care of stuff like, you know, external buttons, um, and perhaps uh, the Wi-Fi module. These are unscrewed and simply pop out in a modular manner. After the top lid of the internal chassis comes away cleanly, it's simple enough to take away the main fan here. You just need to lever out the connection to the main board and away it comes. And here's a closer look at it. All of the principal components in the Series S are numbered and labelled, so uh, if you've never seen a fan before, you've got a helpful label to tell you what it is. The, the black rectangular object on the right there takes up quite a bit of real estate within the Series S, and yeah, actually, that's the power supply. Again, it's modular, it literally slots in and out, and again, it has a nice label on it telling you what it is. At full load, I've seen Xbox Series S draw a relatively small 82.5 watts, but it looks like you're getting a 165 watt power supply here. Series X, for its part, gets a meteor 315 watt equivalent. So at this point, I have initial access to the main board, but I really want to see the main processor and memory. The only silicon we can actually see is the Southbridge chip here, which handles I.O. and curiously it's labelled Xbox One, so I do wonder if that's a holdover part. So accessing the main silicon, the uh, AMD SoC, it's not easy. Problem is, it's underneath this aluminium and copper cooler. So at this point I returned to the underside of the unit and took out those four remaining black screws. Now, Returning to the top of the machine, I pulled out a small metal shield above the USB port there on the left and used the USB port itself for leverage to get the main board out. And flipping over the board, well, take a look at that. It's the 2230 sized M2 NVMe SSD. It's a Western Digital CHSN520 drive, at least in my machine, similar to a PCIe Gen 3 NVMe drive for PC, but the CH designation refers to a custom ASIC on the SSD that elevates it to PCIe Gen 4, albeit operating over two lanes instead of the usual four, and I suspect the other two lanes go to the external storage card. And yeah, while we're here, let's take a look at how that external storage card slots into the machine. 
Next up, it's all about getting that heatsink off, and really this is not easy. It's held in place with a traditional Microsoft X clamp on the rear of the board, and there seems to be no obvious way to remove it without pulling on each end of the clamp aggressively. But remove it and we can start to take a look at the thermal assembly itself. Now I've removed quite a lot of thermal gunk here, and believe me, there's a ton of it in Series S. And you can see the copper heat pipes there and two copper pads on the bottom of this unit. The center pad, that's obviously for the SOC, the system on chip, while the other pad, I suspect that absorbs heat collected from the memory. How does it do that? Well, let's go back to the main board. So again, I've removed lots of green thermal gunk here, uh, but there's the main processor at least, and everything else is hidden beneath that heat shield. However, before we take it off, here's how the Xbox Series X SoC compares to the Series S1 on the board. That's a 360 square millimeter piece of silicon right next to its smaller 197 square millimeter counterpart on the junior Xbox. So the Series S chip occupies around 55% of the area of its Series X equivalent. There are five memory chips instead of 10, around 40% of the power consumption at peak load, and that's what basically separates the two new Xbox models. Looking at the actual floor plan of the chip here with diagrams supplied by Microsoft, the two machines share a lot of the same logic, as you would expect. The only real difference in the size differential comes down to RDNA 2 compute units. We've got 52 active on Series X out of 56 total. Uh, we have 20 on Series S out of a total of 24. And as regular DF viewers will know, four compute units are disabled on both to allow chips with small defects in the silicon to still be used in retail hardware. But I'm digressing, let's get back to the teardown. And that means removing the final elements of the thermal assembly. So let's get that shield off. This involves peeling back something that looks like sort of copper tape and then literally prising off the shield. And yeah, again, once you do this, it's not gonna go back on again. Underneath, we have a horseshoe shaped piece of copper that collects all of the heat from the G6 memory, transferring it to the second pad on that main heatsink. Now that comes away and we can finally access the main memory. Looks like we have eight gigs of RAM here spread across four G6 memory modules, while the remaining two gigs used for system memory, I suspect that's what we're seeing here. It seems to reside on the reverse of the board near the X clamp. So Microsoft really hasn't skimped on the cooling here. It's well thought out, comprehensive, and covers off memory and processor cooling nicely. It's a totally different, more traditional design compared to Series X, but it is effective. The machine is almost as quiet as its larger counterpart. And again, here's how the Series X SoC compares to the Series S equivalent. It's kind of monstrous by comparison. Here's the bare naked board. Tight, compact, highly modular. It's the easiest Xbox to gain entry to. Most of the key components like the power supply, fan and daughter boards just plug in, while the SSD is easily accessible and replaceable, though right now users can't set up the SSD software-wise. So while a physical replacement is easy, actually getting it to operate on the Series S isn't. It's only when you get to the cooling assembly that you have to irrevocably damage the machine to gain access. Now, looking at things a bit more globally, in terms of comparisons to other system boards, I was reminded of the PS4 CUH2000, the revised Slim model. Here's how the Series S and Slim motherboards compare. Now, if you're wondering where the RAM modules are on the PS4, they're on the reverse of the board. And here is the Xbox One S motherboard, Series S's immediate predecessor. And when we put the Series S board down, whoa, check this out. Obviously, the older system is a much larger board, a physically larger system on chip there, a lot more memory modules, and yeah, an obviously more spaced out design. As for why the Xbox One S silicon is significantly larger compared to Series S, which is a lot more powerful, well, this is because the new consoles use the TSMC 7 nanometer process. More transistors can be crammed into a smaller silicon area. The smaller the chip, the cheaper it is to produce. So this is a pretty tremendous gen-on-gen -gen improvement, right? We've previously taken a look at Xbox Series S. From the outside, we're obviously continuously analyzing its game performance, its outputs, 
but it's only from the senseless tragedy of my own tinkering that I have a bricked Series S that I could strip down to its bare essentials. And I've got to admit, from an engineering perspective, I'm really impressed by what Microsoft is delivering here. And at that price point, terrific. And yeah, I've said it several times in the past, and I'm going to say it again. What we have here is a highly integrated board that runs rings around the designs of many gaming notebooks. Kick this thing out with a much larger SSD, build an Xbox Surface laptop with Windows slash Xbox dual boot functionality for both productivity and pure Xbox gaming. And well, I'm in. So I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. And of course, you know what comes next. Like, subscribe, share, and the concept of bell ringing. Consider it if you are subscribed for those hashtag instant notifications when we drop new DF content. Uh, the supporter program. Hang out with the team, get early access and behind the scenes videos, while our DF retro tier makes some of our most in-depth content possible. And of course, yes, pristine quality video downloads of everything we do and everything we have done since late 2016. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.